As you heard, I'm going to talk about names today, nitrous oxide. Um, I'm going to use data that comes from 20,000 people over three years um, about names. And these are some of the names that you all probably know by now. And um, often when we talk about names, we're referring to these things. And we're going to see pictures later on that these are almost becoming redundant. Um, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, the canister. Anyone got a name for it? So I got called. I got told it was when I got this in 2016 from the UK at a place called Tic Tac, who have on display lots and lots of drugs that they test. They called them the crackers at the time, and this is how you could decant one of these into a balloon really, really easily. This goes into your handbag, your wallet, your pocket a lot easier than one of these. And if you wanted to go out night clubbing, it's a lot more obvious this one when you're sort of hanging this one off your pocket. When you're hanging this one off your pocket. Um, but Cameron, what was your word you like to? Well, the, I mean, it's a clean technique, but we, we'd always put the little one to crack up. Oh, okay. The big one is a bulberator. The bulberator, <laughs> yeah. Or a cream dispenser, which, which is, if you just go on Google, that's where you get them from as well. But. Anyone got a name for that? Bulbinator. Bulbinator? So same idea. All right. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, I also like to acknowledge the grounds, the lands on which we all meet today, um, and pay respects to ancestors, past, present, and emerging. So nitrous oxide. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to look for here. Usually, I sort of talk to the slide, and is, if, has this got a pointer on it as well? When I do it, beautiful. Um, what is it? Um, well, basically, it's to understand what it is. It was something that was discovered by Joseph Priestley back in 1793. Um, and he was having a good time in his chemist lab. Um, and he discovered that this product, which was um, inor inorganic, um, it was quite colourless, it was non-flammable, which is pretty cool in terms of not having problems in explosions. Um, and it was based on the chemical structure of, of dye, nitrogen mono monoxide. Using community, we, we're aware of this, right? Nitrous oxide used in hospital settings. We're aware of this is used in dentistry settings as well, and this is because of the very notion that's quite harmless. It can be used for treatments of burns, so the idea of alleviating the pain while you're doing debriding. Um, it's incredibly uh, high volume out with, um, from the, uh, feces and weeds from cows and in paddocks and as well as with fertilisers that we talked about before. And this is where we think about nitrous oxide most of the time when we're talking about harms for community use. So it's about this uh, food-based product and dispensing. The last one, which I'm still not too sure at the moment, is whether or not the nitrous oxides used in cars to boost them for all those who love Fast and the Furious. If you don't have a car with nitro, you're not going to win the race. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same product, but it may have some other additives in it that help the car, and therefore not for human consumption. This is what we think about when we think about recreational use, basically using balloons or any other sort of decanting thing to inhale nitrous oxide from. Um, back in the good old days, people were using these, but doing this straight from the um, valve release and getting mouth burn and freeze, right? So you get these injuries. So once we started to decant, Great harm reduction process using the balloon, but now we still have an issue of volume. So these images are pretty well what you will see when we get media about nitrous oxide, unless it's about harms or someone in hospital. Um, and this is sort of where we're going to talk about. In, for the last, so I would have had my first bowl when I would have been 18 years of age, when I first started working at oh, Barbecue Barn in Cairns. Right, does anyone remember, for the people from Cairns, the barbecue barn opposite St Monica's school? Um, so I was a uh, kitchen hand, I was, um, but someone said, hey, try this, and yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, very short-lived. But this is the good old days of sucking it through there. Somewhere along the line, someone said, hey, if we can decant it into balloons, we can reduce the harms that might occur. And this is the practice that we, we have known for a long time. And I sort of talk about that because there's also another practice that even back, and you'll see here some in the early 70s, um, nitrous oxide used to get stolen from hospital settings 
in the big tins, right? So this is, and you'd have nitrous parties where this will sit in the middle of the, um, the lounge room and you have tubes running off or with regulators and people just run the hose off here. Um, uh, but this was a common practice for those who in the medical industry could get access to. This is where we're going to today, right? So we've commercialised the idea that we have nitrous oxide. So these are all two litre, three and a half litre tins. Um, high volume size that do need a regulator. When I say a regulator, I'm thinking think of the idea of scuba tanks, right? So you need a tube that goes on there to release the air. It goes through a tube and you usually have a mask or something on there or just suck off the hose. Um, so these are becoming more uh, the mainstay around the world and some of this might be commercialisation and opportunity because it's a bigger tank, you don't have to get all the small bulbs and we'll talk about pricing in a moment um, and you only have to carry one thing, right? And if you've got your regulator, away you go. So what is nitrous oxide for cost and availability? Well, if you went onto eBay and you bought a, um, there's my cracker and my balloon and you bought a pack of charges, you can get a, a box, right? So not the small catering boxes with 12 in it, but a, a carton with boxes in it. And it works out for 100 bulbs, it's about 50 cents a bulb, right? Um, you can get your other equipment all as part of the deal, which is really exciting. Um, naturally, again, they don't sell this for food goods, so that's being deliberately targeted for the use of recreational use. And then we have these larger canisters that seem to be going around the place. Now, it's really interesting to think this through because these larger canisters, um, so one of the small bulbs is about eight grams of weight and the large canisters go up to about two kilos. So by expansion, a canister, one canister, is about 125 to 275 bulbs, right? Depending on the size that you're getting, that's that range. And it works out when I, I went through a number of these to try to get the price, it's actually cost more, right? Economy to size, you only got one product, but it's costing you more. However, this is less environmental waste, and I make reference to this because this is the thing going on in the UK at the moment, that it's not so much nitrous is going on, but the waste from nitrous oxide in the parks. Oh, look at all this litter. This is incredible. This is a, 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 a climate catastrophe going on by the youth of today, and this is part of the biggest pitch that they have for trying to ban nitrous. Not necessarily targeting harms. But much like the vaping environment, we're now getting flavoured nitrous, right? So people are now, oh, get your strawberry, get your watermelon. Again, we're having a conversation just before, where's the food-based purposes for this? So these products are being sold purely for the commercial opportunity of people wanting to do home recreational use nitrous, which then creates problems. Now, I, I know you guys should all be familiar with bulbs in the street. It used to be the good old days when I was down in Melbourne, I'll look around for needles on the ground. So now it's quite readily around places. You'll see bulbs instead of needles. We've got a good idea of how, how to get rid of our fits and how to keep, keep, keep the street and environment and harms down, but bulbs are everywhere. Now we're gonna start seeing these. And Cameron was just telling me at, at uh, one of the festivals over in England, um, they had a skip bin full of these. Right? That's what they're doing over here, and it won't be too long before this will be mainstay over here. So the physical, of, uh, physiological effects, this is what it all, all comes down to. This is biologically where you see the effects going on. I won't speak through those because basically we're more interested in about the experience that you get. Get this buzzy effect that lasts for a couple of minutes, and you go, oh man, this is quite intense, and then, then suddenly it's passed by. I love this cat, by the way. Uh, um, so, we, we have this idea that it's typically safe um, and the biggest concern that seemed to be out for a while and still out, so this is a great concern, but there's new physiological problems going on with recent media coming about, about spinal cord injuries and other things, uh, deficits that's going on. But vitamin B12 seems to be a big target that's going on, vitamin B12 deficiencies. Um, this then speaks to folate metabolisms and it can also have these fetal things as well. I notice later on you're going to be talking about um, FASD and I'm starting to um, have a look at what's going on with, with young women who don't know they're pregnant who are doing nitrous in a high volume 
situation might actually be doing some uh, um, fetal based harms that they're just not aware of and this information isn't known yet how much it um, um, goes down unless Jeremy has additional information on that. Um, so basically this is what we experience, got some anaesthesia, some analgia, sedations, pain relief, all these sorts of things. It's quite a good feeling. This is why it works so well in medical settings. Um, the, uh, the other effects is the gagging and coughing. And the ex you know, it's a bit like if you smoke a joint or something, you have these um, instantaneous things that you just get used to and you don't seem to worry because they're low, uh, low, low in terms of consequences of what's going on. The, the biggest one with the B12 deficiencies and these things that are going over is this extremity numbness, right? And if you have too much for too long, this seems to be moving from an acute period to a chronic period with some damage that is going on, um, the neuropathy that we talk about. So I want to give a, um, uh, a time frame, have a coffee sip, and you'll, I'm going to move along the, um, the, the timeline at the bottom as we move through some of these things around nitrous. So as we said back in the 1800s, we, we have a book. It's a great book. I haven't seen the original copy, but I have seen parts of it o online. Um, it'd be really interesting to talk to. And this is the, um, the idea of going through um, what, what the effects were with this monograph of someone using nitrous in a lab, uh, very much an N of one type study. So someone doing it on themselves and writing it down and talking about it. Um, in the uh, early 70s, we started having some academic literature around nitrous oxide going on, and this is the big canisters being stolen. Oh, we got some um, canisters that are being removed from the hospital setting, and we were sort of aware that these are being stolen to be used at these medical parties. Uh, medicos are really into whatever drugs they can get hold of and understand it really well, so they have their own parties in doing this sometimes. But the nitrous, hey, it's quite a harmless substance, we can do this, I know where to get a can canister from. And sometimes we're talking big canisters, right? Huge canisters, um, because they're medical size. They're also medical grade, and this is something that we should come back to later on. Um, I'm quite concerned and interested that the nitrous oxide bulbs that we're getting are food grade based bulbs, that's the first one. And the second one, the large canisters that are being recreationally used for commercial sales aren't even food based. So if you start thinking about this, there's studies out, there's lots of heavy metals that are, um, are being uh, uh, availably ingested when you are, are decanting these um, canisters and using them in balloons. So suddenly you're taking in aluminium, other heavy metals. There's a study going on with the oils, and I'm not going down in the e-valley side of things with vaping, but there's oils that have been going on and being ingested that people are just not aware of because it wasn't ever designed for human consumption in a direct form. So then we had our first case of death in early 1978. It was reported about a 26-year-old white male who had died um, and related to nitrous oxide overdosing. Um, then since the 1980s, there's been a whole lot more that's been going on about trying to understand nitrous oxide in recreational use and people doing these things and academic research that's occurring. But we have... Um, a, a high-profile deaths around the world. Um, we've had people who are a, um, uh, celebrities who have been caught out driving while t using nitrous, of having nitrous at parties. Um, by the way, with the driving stuff, about two months ago, I was in the city of Queensland, uh, city of Brisbane, sorry, we're in Queensland, and um, a young boy with his two mates 14 years of age, across the road, about to get onto their electric scooters, the ones that are around the place, cracked open his balloon, got across the road to the green strips down on Elizabeth Street, and as he scooted off, inhaled his balloon down the road. Right, it blew me away. I, mean, I, was, I was concerned for him for the harms that could occur, right? So... I wouldn't be going off at him for saying you're going to hurt yourself, blah, but I want to say just sit down and do it somewhere and then go off. But you, running to the kid who's running across the road, his reaction time completely impaired, blew me away. 
In Queensland in 2018, we had a death um, where nitrous oxide was a, uh, a contributing factor. And then we've had these other stories that keep on peppering the news now. Um, the Brisbane man who drowned down in the Gold Coast, um, my belief would be he basically had too much, might have hit his head and slid in. I'm not con completely sure of uh, the report that was there, but certainly associated with nitrous use. Um, Anyone follow the story of the young girl over in Perth who got into the media because she went into hospital, uh, unable to walk? Um, so uh, two weeks ago, I think it just came out that she is now out of hospital, still suffering some long-term consequences, but able to walk. Um, but these things are going on. So these are the harm situations, and I'm not trying to catastrophize because at the end of the day, I don't think nitrous oxide is a product of major concern, but great education needs to go on for those who are using it, certainly using too much, and we're gonna talk about that here. So, pulling everything together, Global Drug Survey has been running around since um, 2013, and nitrous oxide has always been asked about from that. It's sort of, um, Global Drug Survey emanated out of the UK, where nitrous was still around in the um, nighttime space more than other places. Most of us are aware of it at home, but not using it outside. So we had it listed in there. Over the years, we've had lots and lots of people do it each year, and the data I'm about to pre present to you from these three years of growth is based on 269,000 people across three years. Um, and these are all people who use drugs recreationally. So the numbers you're gonna see here are about a subsample of the population, people who use drugs, and then of them, about their drug use. So unlike looking at the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, which asks the whole population or a sample of the whole population about their drug use activities, these are about people who do use drugs and about their activities. And the reason why I say that is my percentage for recent use is gonna be higher than the National Drug Strategy Household Survey because of people who use drugs may often use other drugs as well, including nitrous. So this is what it says, out of 50,000 people, we roughly had about 17,000 people who have ever used nitrous. So if you're a substance user of any form, nitrous, one in five of that group is more likely to try nitrous. And it's not surprising if we think on the basic terms that this is quite a harmless drug. In recent use, the last 12 months, about 20,000 people, or 7.5% uh, of that total population have used drugs in the last 12 months. And then in the last 30 days of that same population, about 3% had used it. So most people have tried it, some people still use it, and very few people use it recently. Again, they've got other drugs of choice that they're probably interested in, and this is about a particular subpopulation. In Australia, it's about 2% of the Australian population as of 2019 who've d used an inhalant, and it's, this is something specific with the study itself, the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, they've used an inhalant. It's most likely that inhalant was nitrous or amyl nitrate. Um, so, but that's about 2%. So this is a split for this population who's doing it of those who use a substance and we can certainly see this is something blokes are more likely going to be doing. We see this is something about the younger population are more likely to be doing. The Global Drug Survey starts at the age of 16. Um, it's not something that's used in the old, older cohort but certainly is still used, um, just very rarely. Uh, this is the WHO in terms of country-based stuff, and as you can see, the people in the United Kingdom um, were the people most likely to report using nitrous in the last 12 months. Australia over there, about 6% of the sample that we had, and I think across the three years, about 7,500 people are represented there. So this study, of, of, um, this slide, I've slightly changed at the end that... Um, Back in the good old days, we used to be thinking about bulbs. Most people were using bulbs as the main um, product they were using. Some people were using the bigger containers. But now, with the commercialisation of these two litre containers, this needs to be understood. Because I reckon bulbs are on the way out, while these commercial containers, and you can get them through eBay, etc., are making their way in. And the problem with that is, you've got massive dosage available to you. So if you bought, went down the catering shop, 
and you bought a box, right, and it cost you 15 bucks and you got 12 canisters in it, that's it. 12 doses, if you say doses, Canada. You go out and you buy one of these $200 things, 250 doses, right? That's huge availability for you to do, which is a problem. Um, this is dosing, right? Now, dosing, if we think about this as per session, we sort of regard a dose as being one of these bulbs. You might have three, four, five breaths, depending on what you're doing in, in, with your balloon. But most people typically have few doses in a session, right? This is um, a, ah, this is a bit of a buzz. I'm in between things or about to head out. I've just come home, whatever's going on. However, the idea that people are doing 100 doses in a session, I find this mind-blowing. Mind-blowing for the very fact that it's co you could go out in Australia and buy ecstasy cheaper than it is to getting 100 doses of nitrous, and I sort of go, this is a long time, this is a particular drug you're looking for. I find this incredible, but the practice is going on. So if you're trying to get a drug effect this seems to be not the drug of choice, but people are actually doing this. And this number, 100 for some of the individual records, case presentations, 150, 200 in a session, 1,000 across a week, right? This is huge consumption for a very small number of people. So the Global Drug Survey, and what, what I want to get to here about the harms from nitrous, right? And we have a list of these questions we ask about, about fainting, accidental injury, nausea, uh, confusion, hallucination, and this numbness, right? This is this notion of linking with B12 deficiencies. So these are the harms that could be associated with it. Um, when I present these slides, this one here, these two numbers are the numbers that we use to get this percentage. So we, we're lo looking particularly about those who have indicated they've used in the last 12 months, not ever, and this is because the harm is recent harm from nitrous use. Um, they could have experienced these in their past, but we're only thinking about last 12 months. So we can say, basically say with fainting, about 5% of the people who used nitrous in the last 12 months had indicated they, they'd fainted. Hence, we can go back to this very concept of someone knocking their head, falling into a spa. Accidental injury, um, falling over, tripping on the, on the glass table, all those sorts of things, 2%. The nausea, feeling queasy in the belly. Now, let's think about what nitrous is doing to you. This is not unlikely an experience that people should, be experience, should, should get. So we can see why this is at 10%. This feeling from doing all this nitrous, especially if you've done a fair bit. Now we're at confusion. Um, you don't have to put your hand up, but if you've done nitrous and your head's all spinning around for these few seconds, oh, you've got this effect like the cat, the confusion. At 28%, it makes sense that this is a harm that can be experienced. It's also an a, a experience they're seeking, right? This, this idea of this disorientation that's going on. Hallucinations, we don't ask if it's oral, um, auditory, visual, or all these, but about one in three basically say they experience these hallucinations. And the last one, the one of interest, is this persi persistent numbness. The other ones are typically quite acute. They happen in the ambient. Once, the, once your nitrous session is over, you probably don't have these experience long-lasting. But the persistent numbness does. And persistent numbness, when we're asking about it, is still in your fingers or your toes after four weeks. All right? So persistent has a meaning here. So... This is where I get a little bit nerdy. I've got, a, for those who are mathematically inclined, I've got the model that I put on here. Sometimes I get asked about it. That's why I just put it on, but I'm not going to speak to it. But basically, we're looking at the curve with doses. So we're looking of the harms, in particular around persistent numbness here, and the, the one of most critical concern, the stuff you're reading about with recent, the ABC talked about the spinal cord injury. They'll talk about that in here as well. So this graph here, sorry about... The little kick there, it's moved over. Um, that's not part of my poor graphic design. Um, it just seems to be doing it. Basically, we're seeing this um, curve going up, which says to me, if you read across the bottom, that as you increase the number of doses, the log of doses, that's that 0, 1, 2, 3, and they convert to 1, 2, 7, 20, 55, and 150 doses, 
as you increase your doses of nitrous, your likelihood of reporting persistent numbness significantly increases, right? So we can think about those people we saw in the earlier graph who one, two, three, five doses. They're down there with very low probability, but it's almost five-fold higher. It's still low, right? This, this is, that's 1% at that point one, two, right? So 1% of the sample reporting this, right? It's still low. But what you can see, if you do this too often, too long, too much, your risk of having persist persistent numbness occurring increases. This slide here is the slide I find most critical. The pink is for women, the blue is for blokes, right? So for women, and you, we can understand B12 deficiency playing out here with all sorts of other blood-based things and anemia and all these, that we understand now that for women, high dosing with nitrous oxide has a greater likelihood of reporting persistent numbness than with, beautiful, I'm almost done, this is working really well, than with um, males. And if you guys all understand set in setting when you're taking any drugs, so what, what your mindset is in, who you are, what the setting is in, where you are. This is for clubbers versus non-clubbers. And it's not surprising, because if you threw in amyl nitrate, if you threw in ecstasy and all these other things, as you increase your drug use, the people most likely to do this are those who still go out clubbing, compared to those who don't still go out clubbing. So nitrous, again, is being set in the situation here where it can be a drug that you use at home, but in some situations, it's a drug that's part of the nighttime adventure. Um, and so those who are doing it in those spaces have increased their risk. They've increased their risks of injuries and falls, but also long-term risks as well for um, neuropathy. This changes depending on where you are, and um, I imagine this is about dosage and volume and activities and recognition. So that top blue line is in Germany, and so in Germany, the risks are a lot higher than they are in other places. I'm not too sure exactly why this is playing out so clearly, but there are some clear country effects going on that might have to do with products, availability, and other things like that. In summary, um, basically the things I want to, to get here is across the world, nitrous oxide is still a point of concern for um, engaging in behaviour. Seems to be more than what it was 30 years ago. And I don't know if this is great advertising, great media campaigns from newspapers and stuff reminding young people, hey, nitrous is something you can do, let's look at the story. You guys remember in Brisbane all the time, I ha haven't seen it for a while, but when the Courier-Mail loves to put out about datura poisoning, and then suddenly about three weeks later there's more in hospitals because everyone's gone out and tried some datura because they've just read about it, all right? So the same concept could be going on here. So the links between nitrous and persistent numbness are almost now believed to be true, um, and certainly sitting around B12 deficiencies, so especially with women, this is one of those harms that we need to target. Dosing in particular is what we need to be addressing with the sex difference here. Um, age plays a role with how it plays out. The change in product size, I think, is something that is critical. Um, can I just get a show of hands of how many people are seeing as street litter, the large canisters that I was sort of making a reference to here, or in shops? So I reckon if we're here in two years' time, right, you got all, all of you putting up your hands, right, if we talked about this. Um, I'm really concerned about the heavy metals, right? So FDA says that if you're going to have Food, food and Drug Administration, or uh, the food, TGA, or the food people say how much bad stuff can be in the food for it still to be commercial viable. This isn't going on with canisters, especially the larger ones. And I think this is going to be a problem with a lot of this being produced probably in India and China and all these cheaper places, cheap metals are being used and then being consumed and people just don't understand what's going on. There is a study just recently out, I'm talking two weeks ago, that actually looked at the heavy metal contents on those, and there were four heavy metals, I can't remember them all, but um, aluminium being one of the ones that were in there, that are being expelled into the balloon and then consumed, right? So this is what you're taking in. It's, it's a bit of the conversation about vape, it's what we don't know. Go out and get some medical grade stuff, you're good to go, because these canisters have to meet medical grade approval. Um, 
There's limiting knowledge in what's going on with the education around harm reduction, and that's, if you're going to ask me, that's where the target needs to be. Educate, because you're not going to stop this. It's commercial, it's legal, it's available. Um, at one o'clock in the morning, I've got a friend who lives in Paddington right next to Nangaroo, and at two o'clock in the morning, that's when all the noise comes out of the house as they do their next round of deliveries for the morning run, right? Two o'clock in the morning, shake, 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 he, they can hear the rattles. Um, but this, this is what needs to go on in terms of the best um, way, I think, to reduce harm. You can't ban this unless we take it out, out of the, the arena for commercialisation for hospital settings, because you'll start stealing canisters again. Um, sensible use, so we've got to understand locations, activities, peers, dosing, route of administration, duration, pregnancy, polydrug use, advice that GPs are giving, um, the costs, the law, so kids need to understand when you're ordering it online, you can get in trouble, um, police aren't doing anything about it, one day that might change. That's me. That's the medical situation with the large cans going on, going, hey, we're all having a good time, thanks. And thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. Do we have any questions? Oh, you're welcome. Testing, yeah. Hi, it might be a weird question, but I'm just wondering like, if I was having a conversation with a young person about the persistent numbness, like, what would I say to them as in, you know, how that would be problematic in their life, you know, if you're having this persistent numbness? Because I don't feel like that would quite hit home hard enough for them. Like, how would I then say, oh, you know, it can affect your ability to create a TikTok, you know, or so whatever it yeah. might be, you know, like, I don't know. Have you got any suggestions for I, that? I haven't got suggestions other than the... I, so, in the women's space, I think we, we have an opportunity here about pregnancy, the fear of, of anything transitioning down. That's a really good thing to hook on. For, in general, with persistent numbness, other than this continued... So, the places where we, we, we often hear about this is in the fingers and toes and now across the face. So, there's the continuous tingling and, and numbness feeling that's going on. Um, you could use the woman in um, Perth who could not walk. This is the spinal injury stuff. This is part of the same extension of work because the, 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 the degradation of the myelin sheath on, the, ner on the, um, the nerves in the spine, which is what's believed to be le leading to that. I don't know if that's all completely true, but that's how, how it's being pitched. Um, that means one day you might not work. Right, and if you, if you, and I don't know if you want to go about this as a scare factor, but at least it is around dosing, right? So this is when you say, if you still want to do it or still get, just reduce the dose. I don't know why you're having 100. I don't know why you need two hours of this continued feeling. And if you're going to do that, maybe think about changing your drug choice. But this is really hard when this is legally available, right? So everything else you can get in trouble for. You sort of can get in trouble with getting your, your, your box of nitrous, but I, I haven't even heard of a criminal offence that's gone through at all. With nah, it. No, um, in Queensland, it's not actually an offence to possess the nitrous for anyone. The offence is for a retailer to sell a potentially harmful thing that they reasonably suspect a person is going to misuse, inhale or ingest it. So the um, Nangaroo selling at 2am, um, their line is that a lot of people use whipped cream in sexual practices which occur at two o'clock in the morning. Yep. Um, so th th some of the re other states like WA recently, which I think is actually not a bad idea, they've just banned the sale of nitrous between the evening hours. Yep. Which I think, because we know probably a lot of harmful use is occurring in the middle of the night. And so if you allow it to be sold during the daytime, then caterers are not impacted. But yeah, there's no offence for the end user, but there's definitely uh, irresponsible sale going on. You see the retailers stacking them up uh, at night in the night uh, and the night owl having them as a big pyramid and that's all hilarious. And selling crackers and balloons um, like with nitrous, you know, like that's not legal um, at all, but people are doing it. Yep. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering, yeah, spending it from a quality of life point of view, I guess, like that, you know, um, could that affect their ability to do their job, right, if they're an admin or, you know, things like that, I guess I was just wondering how to 
extended it a little bit there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could probably use those stories for most people if you say, if you reduce your use and do it more infrequently and have a good time whenever you need to. I'm, I'm sort of saying you don't, you're not having an argument and saying, no, no, don't touch, it's bad. Um, but reduce what you do. Is there a link to fetal, um, oh, the defects in the spinal cord from the folate deficiencies? So I'm, I, will never, I will never be doing that research, but I'm going to start reading more about it so I can answer that question, only because there seems to be enough clear evidence. It's very hard, unless it's in my studies and animal studies, to show the causal links because... And when we're, doing, when we're looking at human use, even with the girl over in Perth, there's other substances that are being used and other things that are going on. We never know which started and which was the thing that caused it, but it's part of the story. And it seems to be, whenever we're talking about this um, neuropathy going on, um, people have presented with high-dose nitrous, right? So the, the associations seem to be very present. The causality is still unclear because we need to have the first thing and then the second thing. But it seems to be with the folate issues that it's uh, logical that we're going to have this downstreaming going on with pregnancy. So I'm going to be keeping an eye out of that when I update my slides all the time to see what the new research is saying, especially in the animal space. But I, my belief would be it's very plausible. Yeah, new, neural tube defects that we saw in the 80s before we found out about the folate. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm just interested quickly um, in how it affects the brain. I know that was a really quick slide. I guess my understanding, which might embarrass me, is that it starves the brain of oxygen and that's how you get that effect. But is that right or wrong? What can I tell young people? It's a really brief explanation on how it works. So some of this is really tricky depending on the route of administration. But if we think about breathing, one of the things that was going on for a while, especially with the canisters, is rebreathing. Has everyone heard of rebreathing? So rebreathing is where you, you... I've had my video here, which is on here, but it takes more time. Um, you fill up one of these um, uh, uh, commercial size balloons, right? You can put like three or four um, bulbs of nitrous inside here. And they'll inhale... Right? A bit like if you're having a bong, you've inhaled. But instead of breathing out, they breathe back into the balloon. And they keep on doing this again as the balloon slightly retracts. So they're actually producing, uh, they're uh, reducing the amount of oxygen in their system by having only nitrous and the, and the, and the carbon dioxide that they've breathed back out. And this is now adding to the dizziness. Hey, it's part of the spin that I want in the first place, um, but now causing some extra problems as well. If you breathe in, get the buzz, and then just breathe out normally, then you shouldn't have too much deprivation going on in, in the instance. But if you're doing this lots and lots, you are have, you, you are got to have some residual gases going on in your bloods, which might go to the brain as well. Um, I can't tell you if there's straight cognitive clarity here and whether that's persistent, but there, least acutely it is, and that's the confusion, hallucinations, and all those other things going on. Okay, we've got one last question. That's probably all we've got time for. Over here. Thanks. Um, I was just curious for the people that have been hospitalised or those that have died, like, are there any commonalities as far as the cause of death and hospitalisation or is it just like a variety of those symptoms that you mentioned? So I think there's two types, right? So it's the girl in Perth who appears to have presented to ED, unable to walk by her friends or whatever went on. And I think that is high dose activities and biological change. But I think most of the ones that uh, is going to be more commonplace are the um, acute injuries from confusion, head spins and stuff, and basically falling into the glass table, knocking your head when you fall back or enjoying that moment of bu buzziness going on. Um, but if you add that now to alcohol or other types of substances, so oh, you're too stoned and you do this, and you're just really disorientating what's going on, I think that's where the injuries are going to occur. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners, the Turrbal and Jaguar people and elders past, present and emerging. They say that um, great minds think alike, so I hope you'll... Uh, forgive me if some of my slides are very similar to Jason's, but we do have some slightly different angles because I'm coming at a slightly more clinical perspective. And uh, I, I guess many of you may have seen 
nitrous affected individuals. I can only really think of one or two over the past 20 years who've actually come to our service uh, saying they've got a problem with this. Um, I've seen occasional patients hospitalized with the neurological consequences. Um, however, they're not really walking into Biala and saying, I need help. So this is a slightly different um, perspective compared with someone with an alcohol disorder who is really showing up saying, help me, I'm stuck. So um, this was the title I gave this, and I was under a, a mistaken belief that Queen Victoria, uh, going to childbirth with her seventh or eighth child, had been given nitrous. Uh, in fact, she was given chloroform, but the two were discovered at around the same time as effective in providing analgesia. And as you'll see on a slide to come, she was delighted. And notice, Jason went for the cat, I've gone for the dogs. <laughs> a few disclosures, but uh, nothing related to today's presentation. Uh, I'll just read this out, because I think, although it's from the gray literature, it really brings home the challenges that um, this can prevent, present. I took my first whippet only two months ago. Since then, not a single day has gone by where I haven't huffed balloons. I've known about the dangers of B12 deficiency since day one, but I just can't stop. I've spent so much money, I've gone through thousands of these things in the last two months, I can't stop myself. I made pretty good money at my job. Money hasn't been an issue for me in years, but now all of a sudden, I'm totally broke for the first time in so long. I just ordered yet another 600 pack, but even with that, I couldn't wait. So I just went down to my local head shop, spent my last $90 uh, on a 100 pack. It's so bad that the guy working there immediately recognized me and asked how many I wanted. As soon as I walked in the door, my trash bags are completely filled with whippets. My legs and feet are numb, and I'm having trouble walking. I don't know how to stop. So that's um, quite a wake-up call, really, isn't it? The trouble that people can find themselves in. Um, now, this is from a publication just last year. One notable example presenting to us was an affluent 19-year-old international student. And that's one theme that goes through some of the, the papers that have been published. So this is in Australia, a student from overseas. So fairly isolated, uh, away from home, homesick perhaps, looking to relieve their distress. They came to the emergency department, thought disordered, so that's the psychosis that Jason referred to perhaps, unable to walk or use her hands. She'd been able to afford and access $750 worth of nitrous charging canisters per night for seven consecutive nights. So in that very brief, very intense use of nitrous, she developed these major neurological uh, complications. So I've got a different date for the discovery from Jason. And <laughs> while he was talking, I just um, looked on the phone, and actually both dates are given. So. I don't know which is right. Sometime in the late 1700s, nitrous was discovered. Now, Joseph Priestley was quite a fascinating fellow um, because two years later, after my version of the discovery, he um, recognized dephlogisticated air, which he attributed to phlogiston. Now, phlogiston doesn't actually exist. What he discovered was that when you put a flame in a bell jar, uh, the candle will extinguish itself not because of accumulation, do I mean accumulation? Saturation, yes, accumulation of phlogiston, but a depletion of oxygen. So he got that the wrong way around. Lavoisier, who was a Frenchman, and of course, English and French, they've always been at odds with each other. They showed that this was actually the lack of oxygen, but the Poms decided these bloody French trying to get it on the act will reject their version as long as they could, but eventually uh, truth prevailed. So nitrous, as we've seen from Jason, it became popular at laughing gas parties. And then we get to the tale about B12 inactivation. Now, I don't know any of you familiar with the poetry of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He wrote Kubla Khan, which is quite an iconic poem. He described his use of nitrous. The first time I inspired the nitrous oxide, I felt a highly pleasurable sensation of warmth over my whole frame. The only motion which I felt inclined to make was that of laughing at those who were looking at me. My eyes felt distended, and towards the last, my heart beat as if it were leaping up and down. On removing the mouthpiece, the whole sensation went off almost immediately. So there he describes the very short-term action, and I think that helps us understand why people use many, many of these bulbs in a sitting, because the effect is so short-lived, and they want more of it, so they use more of it. 
Um, recall that Coleridge later wrote uh, Kubla Khan, as I said, probably under the influence of opium. So he was quite a substance user, but back then it was all legal and legitimate, of course. So here's Queen Victoria. It was the birth of Prince Leopold, her eighth child, when she was given chloroform, blessed chloroform, soothing, quieting, and delightful beyond measure. So it wasn't nitrous, but nearly, not far off. The first use of nitrous was just a few years earlier by Horace Wells doing a, a dental extraction in 1844. This is the same slide as Jason, the nitrous laughing parties, laughing gas, because uh, that's one of the responses. And I recall as about an 11-year-old going to the dentist on my push bike and having an extraction and kind of giggling as I cycled home rather wobbly. So maybe the effects lasted a bit longer than uh, for Coleridge. Perhaps he was uh, a tried and tested user. I don't know. So the pharmacology is not fully understood. However, we've got a reasonable idea. It is a sweet, colorless gas, very lipid-soluble. And when it's lipid-soluble, that means it gets into the brain very quickly. So crossing through the lining of the lungs into the brain very, very quickly. Um, NMDMA glutamate, so that's excitatory. So if you block that, you kind of feel calm and relaxed. Uh, alcohol has a similar effect. Uh, release of endorphins, so we all know endorphins supposedly help us feel, feel good, feel calm. It, it binds to all the three opioid receptors listed there. So if you give naloxone to someone and then nitrous, it no longer works as an analgesia. So it's described as a dissociative anesthetic or dissociative agent because it also produces analgesia. So it has those two effects in kind of terms. Um, it seems to damage rat brains, unfortunately, those that live long enough. So that leads us to believe there are longer term effects on cognition and memory. So um, as we saw from one of Jason's slides, it's widely used uh, in labor. Uh, we were in Switzerland a few years ago. My wife fell and broke her hip, and we went to a local hospital, and uh, they wanted to do uh, uh, an MR, no, sorry, a, a CT scan of her hip, um, and she found it so painful to move that there was no uh, anaesthetist available, no one could help out, and then someone had the bright idea of getting the Entonox, as it's called, uh, canisters from the ED to the x-ray department and when she was given Entonox, wonderful, she could be moved across onto the uh, table for, for the x-ray. So very effective for those sorts of purposes. Uh, used in dentistry, I've said, racing cars as a fuel to increase, increase thrust and it's very useful in producing whipped cream as we've heard and it's also used elsewhere in the food industry because it has uh, preservative qualities. Um, now, Jason mentioned the household survey. I would add that it's only 14 years and above that are questioned. So, although we have this statistic of 1.4 um, in 2019 admitting to the use of inhalants, um, uh, it's estimated that about over half of those would be nitrous, plus amyl and other uh, agents. Uh, they're not questioning kids under 14, so it's not a full picture, is it? Um, so, hard to get a full picture. Um, World Drug Survey is people who want to volunteer information. So actually getting the population stats is, is tricky. So um, we've heard about the effects, euphoria, laughter, of course, blurred vision, numbness, incoordination, sweating, uh, hypotension, sudden death. Um, chronically, that's really the important stuff. Of course, injuries may occur due to intoxication, as with many other substances. It's the chronic stuff that I think people need to become more aware of. So memory loss, incontinence, and I'm presenting a patient a little later who has an indwelling, indwelling catheter at the age of 20 because her bladder no longer works. Peripheral numbness, as we've heard, um, dependence, as we've heard, uh, psychosis, as we've heard. And this all really seems to come down to vitamin B12 deficiency. So why do we use nitrous to whip cream? Wouldn't it be better to use something else to take the whole nitrous uh, industry out of action? Well, there are no suitable alternatives. Nitrous uh, expands the volume of cream about four times and gives this wonderful texture that people look for. Um, hydrocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, since the Montreal um, Treaty, no longer available because of ozone damage. Carbon dioxide, which is acidic, uh, makes the cream fizzy and curdled. Alcohol leads a nasty taste, and oxygen 
makes it rancid. So really, for the whipped cream enthusiast, there is no suitable alternative. As I said, it's a dissociative substance, and you can't really see that, so I'll move on. And this just explains a bit exactly what's happening with the B12 uh, activity. So um, nitrous inactivates the production of methionine and the production of succinyl-CoA. So methionine is an essential component in the marlin sheath production and maintenance. And succinyl-CoA is part of the energy cycle of the Krebs cycle, or the tri TCA, tricarboxylic acid cycle, so which produces energy that keeps us all going in our mitochondria. So when you knock out the B12 with uh, nitrous, then those two products are no longer um, available, and we have an accumulation of um, homocysteine and methyl mal malanonic acid. And those, which you can see on the table, those are the clues that someone may have been using nitrous because even when they present with symptoms, they may have uh, normal levels of vitamin B12, as I'll show you in a slide. So this is a patient who presented um, with numbness and, uh, and inability to walk. And when they turned up um, a presentation, their B12 level was 150. You can see the range is 140 to 770. Uh, at follow-up at six months, they had a greatly raised B12. No harm seems to come from high levels. The harm comes from low levels. The clues we can get are from methyl malonic acid. As you can see, the normal range is up to 280, and the patient there was 1885, and also from homocysteine, uh, normal range up to 12, and here the level was 22. So we can't just rely on a serum B12 to tell us that everything's okay. Um, I've got a slightly different timeline from Jason, but anyway. So understanding has gradually increased. There were a couple of reports um, in The Lancet in 78, and you may not have heard of Dr. Schilling, but he's immortalized in medicine for the Schilling test, which was trying to work out the absorption of vitamin B12, which has a very complicated pathway. It relies on an intact stomach with intrinsic factor, which links to the B12. That floats down the bowel to the terminal ileum, where it's taken up by specialized cells. So it's, it's a fascinating process. Um, and he described two patients who had a low vitamin B12 level that he was probably investigating, who then had a general anesthetic with nitrous oxide. And subsequently, they developed symptoms. Uh, later on, um, there's the case that I'll describe, um, and a review of recreational use, seven cases of the Royal Prince Alfred, I think, is that in Melbourne? I think so. And then China, lots of cases at one single hospital, then cases in Melbourne again, and the most recent paper that I saw was of 119 cases from three or four hospitals across the UK. So this seems to be growing, doesn't it? And here's Schilling's earlier paper from 86, um, a dangerous anesthetic for um, B12 deficient subjects. Nitrous is not used so much these days, but uh, 30 or 40 years ago, it certainly was in anesthesia. Um, here's another uh, report, toxicity of intermittent inhalation of nitrous oxide for analgesia. This was a young man who had um, major abdominal surgery, uh, removal of the colon, construction of a pouch, and as used to happen in those days, things didn't go well, so he had terrible pelvic sepsis with ongoing drainage and dressing changes. And for that, he was given nitrous. And uh, he went home with a cylinder or two, found it was quite pleasurable, and uh, developed weakness and paresthesia such that he couldn't walk. Uh, so he had to be readmitted, was replenished with B12, the nitrous was ceased and his symptoms, fortunately for him, settled with a full recovery, because as we'll see, that doesn't always happen. Um, this was a review of the literature. They found 91 cases in 2016. Um, predominant symptoms, numbness and paresthesia, that's tingling. Uh, weakness, uh, bladder and bowel affected. Uh, there's this odd physical sign, le meets, that when you flex your neck forward, you get shooting, burning electric pains down your back. That's a sign that uh, things aren't well in your spinal cord, I'm afraid. Uh, about 10% had a psychiatric presentation, some had delusions, and they found 29 patients who died, mainly from hypoxia, as we were discussing earlier. So quite a significant proportion of their case, the symptoms improved, uh, but in a number, they persisted. Um, we will go on from that. That, well, that was a case from uh, Melbourne, a, a series. And what I'd like to point out is that 
uh, we've got a table of seven patients here, uh, ages in the early 20s, most of them, uh, both male and female, and uh, almost, no, two of them had, had, no, sorry, four of them had supplemented with B12, so they were sufficiently aware of this risk of complications that they were taking extra B12. Um, however, what we will show is that that did not actually prevent the harms occurring. Um, they had uh, high levels of homocysteine, one of those markers of B12 deficiency from uh, nitrous oxide use. And um, just to point out that the modified ranking score, which was a mark of their disability, barely budged between admission and discharge. So four is a level that requires assistance in walking and attending to bodily needs. So that is a pretty severe level of disability for someone in their early 20s. And as you can see across there, that basically the scores didn't really improve much from presentation to discharge. Um, so nitrous oxide neurological disorders, an increasing public health concern. This is from the Royal Melbourne. Uh, they had 13 cases. Uh, interestingly, two got worse after B12, and I don't know whether that's uh, fully understood. Um, they found five international students, as we mentioned before, um, Lack of family support, uh, isolation, stress, and anxiety about studies may kind of explain why that might happen. And seven locals, all with prior mental illness or substance use disorder. Um, so this is the big study that I mentioned earlier from the UK. And what they've got on the right there is a kind of map of the spinal cord. And you can see in red the areas that have been most affected. And it's typically the cervical spine. Uh, so that, if that's not working, then you know, your, the rest of your spine's not, the spinal cord's not going to be performing very well either. Um, I thought I'd just spend a moment talking about vitamin B12. You can see the enormously complicated molecule there. Um, it's a bit like hemoglobin, uh, where iron is the central uh, metallic iron, uh, though here it's cobalt. And Dorothy Hodgkin was the uh, scientist uh, who got a Nobel Prize as well as fellowship at the Royal Society. She discovered the structure of um, vitamin B12, as well as going on to discover the structure of insulin. Um, and she spent 35 years uh, in this uh, search. Uh, Bragg, who was an Australian who went to Cambridge and worked as a scientist there, he said that her discovery was as significant as breaking the sound barrier. Um, another claim to fame of Dorothy Hodgkin is she taught Margaret Thatcher chemistry as an undergraduate. So what is being done? We've heard a little bit about that. Well, the TGA has listed nitrous in the poison schedule, and as I'm sure all your um, patients you see will be reading the poison schedule uh, very carefully to work out what they can and can't do. Uh, in various states, it is an offense, as I understand it, Cam, to supply nitrous canadas for non-medical human consumption. Uh, in South Australia, um, I saw recently, it is an offence to sell to people under 18 um, between the hours of 10 o'clock and 5 a.m., as we heard, um, or to display in retail stores. Now, clearly, we need more education about the harms, though the courier-mail effect, where you try and provide that education, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? Because people say, oh, well, let's go and find out about that. So there's about eight grams of nitrous in one of those nangs, and that produces eight litres at normal pressure. And the cream canisters there, which are uh, the d one way of dispensing the gas, um, they're also sold by these Nang shops. Um, so here's the young lady uh, that we still see in clinic. She had been using for 18 months uh, up to 420 Nangs a day. It's, it's very hard to believe, isn't it? And she presented with uh, difficulty walking, numbness in hands and feet, and uh, she required an indwelling urinary catheter for urinary retention. Now, she was also using a range of other substances, so that kind of complicates matters, doesn't it? Including alcohol, uh, suboxone she bought on the street. I don't know where she got all this money from, but I'll leave you to guess. Uh, tobacco, alprazolam, and codeine. She'd had previous overdoses uh, and had submission. She discharged herself. So a very troubled young woman. Um, on the viewer, which is the Queensland Health way of recording uh, admissions to public hospitals, she had 58 pages, and each page has at least 10 uh, presentations to emergency departments or hospitals. So a huge, uh, a huge kind of load on, on the health service from this troubled young woman, um, including a, a, a one-year admission at the age of 14 to a, a, 
a mental health unit for adolescents. So pretty serious stuff, I'm afraid. Um, Neptune is a, a UK-based um, repository of uh, information and advice, and they've got some harm reduction tips. I, I really, you know, I think these are sensible, but they're pretty bleeding obvious too, and I think we've got to try and go a bit further, but I don't know how we do that. So users should always inhale nitrous from a balloon, never from the dispenser itself. Uh, I don't know that there's anyone still doing that. Users must be careful not to confuse nitrous with other gases. Well, yeah, obviously. They should avoid inhaling while standing on the edge of a cliff. Yes. I mean, if you need to receive that sort of advice, then you've probably got severe cognitive impairment, haven't you? Um, nitrous should be avoided in particular by people with problems with low blood pressure or mental health issues. Yeah. Uh, as we've seen, most people with mental health issues or uh, substance use issues, they're the ones who are looking for nitrous. So they're obviously not reading that part of the uh, harm reduction advice, and regular and long-term users of nitrous should be aware of the purity of the product. So that's back to our heavy metals and stuff. Um, and they should stop inhaling if they feel any physical discomfort, such as pins and needles or numbness. So I'm sorry, I don't really think that's going to solve the, the challenge that we all face. Um, so in summary, nitrous provides a brief, self-limiting rush of euphoria, which people really come to like. NANGs seem readily available, uh, home delivery, the regulations such as they are, are certainly not working. Use seems to be increasing, we've seen from those uh, worldwide drug surveys and uh, so forth. Um, national drug strategy inhalants don't differentiate, but that seems to be about 60% and we're not talking to the under 14s there. Um, uh, nitrous blocks two crucial coenzyme steps involving B12. Um, and B12 also may affect cytokines, which are kind of inflammatory mediators, so TNF-alpha and interleukin-6. So that may lead to complications with um, inflammation and uh, fighting infection. Serious neurological complications. We've, we've seen death, we've seen disability and lasting disability, even when people have been admitted to hospital, their nitrous use has ceased, and they've received... Uh, big doses of vitamin B12. Unfortunately, as we saw in that uh, table I showed you, if you continue to use B12, having started to develop those symptoms, then you can take as much B... Sorry, if you continue to use nitrous, having developed some symptoms, you can take as much B12 as you want. It won't prevent the, the, the symptoms from B12 deficiency developing and progressing. So really the answer has to be um, drastically reducing or quitting altogether if you're to avoid the fate of the young woman I presented who's got um, still numbness in her peripheries and an indwelling urinary catheter. B12 daily tablets, so you don't need to have an injection. You can have daily tablets. That wonderful mechanism I described in the stomach going down to the terminal ileum that's actually one selective um, process for low levels of B12. If you give big doses, which is 1,000 micrograms a day, you can sort of overwhelm the system and the vitamin is taken up by other cells too. So taking it daily, this young woman did, hated having injections. So I said, well, look, just take a tablet every day. That'll help protect you as long as you're not using uh, nitrous as well. So I think that's the end, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Haler. Does anyone have any questions before we hand over to Cam? So I'm new to this industry. So um, is, there, is there a difference then between if a young person is, is using nitrous oxide and if they're using things like petrol or you know, deodorant cans, oil cans, like? Well, the difference is this specific effect on vitamin B12. If they're inhaling other volatiles, then they are accompanied by their own complications. Yeah. And so if they're... So with the nitrous, is there still that risk of sudden death from the inhaling? Well, um, so volatile substances can have an effect on the cardiac rhythm. I don't believe nitrous has that effect. Yes. However, if you lose protection of your airway through loss of consciousness, then you can slide into your spa and drown, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. there's many ways to die, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering. So if we have our young people and they come to us and they're you know, using uh, the nitrous, like what should we tell them that they should speak with their GP about? Like how should we tell them to kind of have that conversation? What what sort of support should we be asking them to ask for from their GP? Yeah, I mean, I think Jason made the point that trying to scare people into submission is probably not very helpful because the more you say don't um, because then the more people will feel, oh, that might be good. So I think it's a really um, difficult area. I think we can just try and prevent, present as much uh, information in an unemotional and calm way. Uh, if we describe patients we've seen in the past and describe what happened to them, then I, I would hope that sort of information can lodge. But, you know, teenagers, they're bulletproof, aren't they? And it's not going to happen to them, and it's fun, and why should they worry? So I do think it's a really major challenge. And that's why better regulation and better uh, reduction in availability would, would help. But I don't know if everyone is aware of Chop Chop, illicit tobacco supplies, which is far cheaper than the tax stuff. Um, there's also packets of tobacco that have avoided duty, which you can get 20 cigarettes for $10, say. So we know that the, the market, the neoliberal agenda, drives things uh, well ahead of regulation, unfortunately. So that just to make sure I've understood as well, like with the B12 thing, we it, it can be helpful, but it can't. So a little bit is okay if they get that from their GP, for example, um, but we wouldn't say with like the alcohol when we recommend that's a bit of a different situation. Is that Have I understood that right? Yeah, I think we have to be careful about representing B12 as a sort of gold standard for managing the symptoms because it has to be accompanied by a drastic reduction or stopping altogether. So that table I showed you before with um, the patients who barely made any improvement, even though some of them had actually been taking B12 along the way because they were being smart, they thought this would protect them. It doesn't if there's the ongoing presence of the nitrous, which inactivates those two enzymes. So no matter how much B12 you have, uh, you're still not going to deliver your end product, the methionin and the succinyl catalin. Yeah. Um, just on that B12, is there any research to show how long of use prior to any kind of neurological deficit in regards to ongoing deficiency in B12? Like, what would be the time so frame? You mean how quickly it recovers or how quickly it develops? How quickly it develops. Well, we saw one of those early slides was a, a, an international student who'd been spending $750 a night for a week, and she developed psychosis and numbness. So it can develop very, very quickly. Of course, it will depend on whether your underlying B12 is, is low or high. That will make some difference. As we saw in those two patients who had an anesthetic with nitrous, they developed symptoms afterwards because they had low B12 to start with. So range of factors, but it can seem to come on very quickly. And um, particularly in those case series for hospital admissions, recovery is not always anything like what you'd hope. 